Hello everybody. If someone were to ask you what you think is the most underrated game of all time, what would you say? Some indie title, an underappreciated AAA release, or an obscure region locked game that hasn't seen the light of day outside its country of origin? Well, for me, a game that always springs to mind when asked that question is Civilization Revolution. <laughs> Now, what is Civilization Revolution? I can hear you shouting cynically at your screen. Now firstly, calm down, relax, take a chill pill, and I'll tell you in about two seconds. Civilization Revolution is a strategy game developed by Firax Games, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, and I don't really care, and published by 2K Games in 2008. Firax Games being the people who worked on Civ 6 and are currently working on the upcoming Civ 7 and 2K games being the publishers of some other small insignificant video game franchises that I'm sure don't have millions of fans now I know what you're gonna say turn-based strategy that sounds boring I want to go around ripping demons into pieces while I completely understand that sentiment as I for one would also love nothing more than to go around ripping demons into pieces, I also do have to admit that from time to time, I would also love nothing more than to conquer the world as Caesar or Mr. Bonaparte, or Montezuma as well I guess, I don't really know why he's here. Never heard of the guy outside of this game. Ooh, look at that little dance, okay, never mind, he's redeemed himself. Same goes for Shaka. Never heard of the guy outside the game, but he does get a pass when it comes to being made fun of as he's extremely overpowered. My man's a chad, I'm not making fun of him. But also, look at that face. Do you really want to make that face upset? So in total, we are looking at 16 leaders, 16 different civilizations. Okay, from now on, if either of the words civilization or revolution comes up, I'm just going to shorten them. We're barely into the video and I already can't be bothered. Sounds cool? No? Well, it's my channel, so... Yeah? Now look, if you have any serious complaints, you can let me know in the comment section. But now look, not all these sieves are created equal. Some are exceptionally great, and using them honestly feels like cheating, and some are so useless they suck big hard juicy carrots. I'm looking at you, Mr. Dancing Jungle Man. When it comes to determining the quality of a sieve, the main metric used to measure is the special abilities each of them possess. Now I know what you're saying. I don't know what any of these mean. Which abilities are good and which ones are useless. Well my friend, that all depends on what type of victory you're going for. See, in Civ Rev, there are four different ways you can win the game. Well, technically 4.5 but shut up. An economic victory which requires earning 20,000 gold or whatever the in-game currency is. Wait, now that I think about it, shouldn't the currency name be different for each sieve you play as? Huh, never thought of that until now. Next there's a scientific victory where you have to be the first sieve to send humans to the closest star system Alpha Centauri. A cultural victory which requires you to acquire a total of 20 great people and great wonders. And finally, a domination victory, which requires you to conquer all four of the other sieves in that same match. But another way to earn a domination victory, also known as the I'm bad at video games way, is by just waiting for the game to reach 2100 AD without achieving any of the previously mentioned victories, in which case the game just awards an automatic domination victory to the sieve with the highest score. This is hands down the worst way to win the game. It is the textbook definition of deflating. It's just so boring. Getting to 2100 to begin with feels like an incredible chore. A word of advice, play good so the game doesn't drag on to that point. Something I forgot to mention earlier is that this game, like pretty much every other game in existence, has difficulty settings. Starting from baby chieftain all the way to big boy chad deity. Now, unless you're a masochist, I highly suggest you don't exceed king difficulty in your earlier playthroughs, 
as doing so will likely go as well as picking a fight with Mike Tyson. So let's say you're going for a cultural victory. In that case, a sieve that attracts more great people, can construct wonders more frequently, or has the ability to build culture boosting buildings as soon as possible, you know, as culture increases the likelihood of attracting great people, would be your best bet. But if you're going for, say, an economic victory, you'd want a sieve with high gold production. Same goes for a technological victory, just replace gold production with science production. For a domination victory, there really is only one sieve you should be playing as, so unfortunately any sieve other than that one that is geared towards a domination victory is unfortunately not very good. So once we enter the game, we are greeted with the option of where to put our city. A good spot is going to look the same no matter what victory you're going for. You need the seaside for gold and science production, which is essential for everyone at least to a certain point. You'll also need trees and hills as production is once again essential for everybody. This is basically what the early game looks like. Producing warrior units every few turns and sending them around to explore the world. You will almost certainly come across barbarians that you will almost certainly beat every time. Honestly, the more and more I've played this game over the years, the more and more I've come to feel sorry for these weird aliens. I've done nothing but commit mass genocide on them over the years. They are without a doubt the most incompetent video game enemy I think I've seen in my life. Wait, no, I take back what I said. I forgot about the skeletons in Skyrim. The only way I think you could lose to these things is if you were to attack with one or two warriors, and since nobody with a functioning brain would do that, it never happens. Also, now that I think about it a bit more, these guys are still human, aren't they? Anyways, you're also likely to meet another Civ during these opening turns. Now at the beginning, this isn't really a problem, but let me tell you, during the latter half of the game, you will constantly be bombarded with threats. Give me this technology or we do war, give me this much gold or we do war, and you declining is usually met with them making a face that closely resembles the backside of a hippopotamus and getting close to your screen and if this event happens to occur while I'm playing poorly there is nothing and I mean nothing more I want to do than to run and jump headfirst into my television screen. It is during this part of the game where you have to start picking which technological advancements you're going to make. Now these are really important as each new technology learnt will allow you to erect a new building or train a stronger more advanced type of troop or allow you to switch governments. But the speed of this comes down to the amount of science you are producing so you must balance your priorities well. The technology you decide to choose will once again come down to the playstyle you have chosen. You also pick buildings you want to build with each building being beneficial in its own way. You get to train troops, some offensive, some defensive, some on land, some in water, and some in the skies. Again though, sorry if I sound like a broken record here, but this all depends on the kind of playstyle you're going for. You can't just do everything unless you want to, you know, lose. But I know you're gonna do it. You're gonna load a game, pick that stupid feather-haired jackass, waste turns building markets, temples, and libraries back to back to back, all the while simultaneously researching technologies that don't complement each other, and then that in for a penny, in for a pound switch in your head is gonna go off, and you're gonna go and change your government type to communism and build settlers so that you can create a dozen more cities and repeat this process until your nuts explode! Now, there is only one feasible way this ends. Another civilization marches to your capital, and simply takes it with no defiance whatsoever. Why? Because your communist, fantasy-filled ass forgot to train troops to protect the capital, as you were too busy constructing buildings and wonders like there was no tomorrow. Now, if this in any way sounds appealing, firstly, please, go see a doctor, and secondly, if you do decide to proceed, don't come back to this video once it's all done and start stirring stuff up in the comments about how this is, was all somehow my fault. I warned you, mother trucker. Now that I think about it, comments help the algorithm, don't they? 
Okay, I take back what I said. Please stir stuff up in the comments. Anyways, that's basically how a round will play out. You'll keep constructing and building stuff. You'll keep researching technologies and getting into fights until someone wins. Unless you carry out a strategy that I am extremely fond of. Now, this might come off quite strange to anybody who's played the game before. Or it might not. I really don't know what the Civ Rev fan community looks like or if this is a popular strat within the community. So, what you do is you just stay where you are from the very start of the game. You don't build any troops, only buildings and wonders. You just stay where you are researching all the technologies you desire and you don't encounter any distractions in the form of other civs. Also one of the most valuable consequences of using this strategy is the insanely high culture you will likely incur and the reason for this is the borderlines that it will create. So, in Civ Rev, having a high culture level will result in you having really large and vast borderlines. This makes it incredibly difficult for other civilizations to meet you, considering the fact that the only way they can meet you is by getting close to you, and the only way they can do that is by crossing the borderlines, and that can only be done by declaring war, and you can't declare war on a Civ you haven't met. It's an endless cycle of tomfoolery. Now, I think it's time for me to go over each Civ and determine their competency level, from left to right. First, and definitely not least, we got Caesar of the Romans. I think it's safe to say that this man is easily one of the best Civs in the entire game. His abilities make him hands down the best Civ in the game for cultural victory. More great people, wanders cost 50% less, and more population in new cities. What more could I ask for? Next up we have... Did they do this on purpose? Anyways, Mrs. Cleo and her Egyptians really don't have anything special about them. They get more food from desert regions which are very situational. They know irrigation and begin the game with an ancient wonder. I guess those aren't bad for a cultural run, but why choose her when Caesar exists? I mean, he's right next door. I mean, I feel like it would be rude. He can probably hear us because he's standing right there, one sieve to the left. And I don't think Caesar is someone you want to piss off, so just, so just go for him. He might be giving off a cute little smile right now, but I'm warning you. Don't be fooled. Just... Just run. Also, on a side note, for the longest time, I thought that the circular object he was holding was a ball, but after around 10 years of playing the game, I realized it was his goddamn helmet. Hey, look, j don't look at me like that. It looks like a ball, goddammit. Leave me be! The mighty Alexander of Greece. This man right here is a solid option. Begins the game with democracy, which is good for science and gold production. Also has a courthouse from the get-go, meaning you can get access to those extra resource squares immediately. And you get more great people, which is always useful. Their lack of specialization does hinder them when being compared with some other civs though, but still a solid, well-balanced civ. Isabella from Spain. Why bother? Completely worthless, unfortunately. None of her abilities are useful. Apart from the increase in gold production, which by the way doesn't come into effect until the latter half of the game. Also, the increase in gold production can't make up for the suckiness of all the other abilities she has. Up next, we have the formidable Germans, led by Bismarck. Well, I would say formidable if they didn't suck. On the surface, they look like they're really good, but once you take the time to go over their abilities, you realize there's nothing really here. The interest in gold comes way too late. They start the game with veteran warriors, just build barracks instead, and the other two abilities are so pointless or situational, I'm pretty sure it's illegal to even mention them. Oh man, I'm gonna get fired. Also, if you got that reference, I love you for life. Rest in peace. The only good thing the Germans have is the automatic upgrade for elite units, but that's not good enough, boy. Or should I say, boy. Next up, another global superpower and another butchery. There's no other way to put it. They've been butchered. They've butchered Catherine and her Russians. 
getting extra food from planes ain't horrible, but your city is not going to have an insanely high number of plane squares, as it has to be balanced with production producing squares like hills and forests. Another sieve in a little bit does the whole getting extra food from resource squares thing better as they get it from resource squares that are more abundant, making the Russians pointless in that department. Giving loyalty to defensive troops is pretty good, but you can achieve that through other means. So I mean, what is there to say? She has no abilities good enough to really justify playing as her. Now, we have another global superpower, and guess what? They haven't been butchered. Mao and his Chinese people are pretty good, probably the best sieve for a tech run. They begin with writing, they learn literacy early on, and can build libraries for less in the second half of the game, which could be useful if you're going to play with more than one city. So yeah, pretty good. The land of hot dogs and baseball matches is next. And let me just say, Mr. Abraham, you might just be the best Civ in this game. Or maybe the second, look, I don't know, they're top two for sure. Interest on gold reserves from the very start, which is absolutely redonkulous. Your gold is going up by itself from the very start. You have a great person spawn with your settlers at the beginning, and your factories give you triple production. I mean, damn, what is left? Now, before you clowns start clowning, yes, I know that triple production only appears at the tail end of the game, but guess when you can start to build factories at the earliest? The tail end of the game! Now, I know what you're gonna say. How could anybody top that? How could you even consider the Americans being second? Well, my child, this is why. Tokugawa and the Japanese. Now, from the surface, it might not seem like the Japanese are anything crazy, but when you dig deeper, you find the presence of a singular ability. An ability that feels like the devs accidentally kept in the game. It's the ability they start with. One extra food from C-squares. Firstly, it's impossible to not get the benefits of this ability, as it's from C-squares, and every city is going to have a few. And if your city doesn't, why didn't you just restart the run at the beginning when you got a garbage spawn? Why? This increases the rate at which your city grows exponentially, which in turn increases the rate at which your resource production goes up tenfold. It is the definition of OP. They also get ceremonial burial early, and the addition of loyalty and ability that increases the defense of troops to troops at the end of the game when you're probably defending your cities is pretty awesome too. They are the best. I love them. And I find it really hard to pick between them and America, but if push came to shove, I think I'd go with Japan. And also, that definitely has nothing to do with the fact that Japan is like my favorite country in real life. Definitely no bias there. Mr. Bonaparte is next, and he's pretty okay, I guess. Nothing special. Cathedral and pottery at the beginning can help culture, but again, why pick him for a cultural run when you have Caesar? He's not bad by any means. By himself, he's pretty good, but the presence of Caesar makes him pretty redundant, I'd say. So yeah, not good or bad. Napoleon and the French are just kinda there. The only reason I can think of playing Gandhi is so that you can create the scenario of him nuking other civs. That's it. Otherwise, completely pointless. Nothing redeeming whatsoever. Same applies to... Saluting. The Arabs have nothing. And I mean nothing. There's nothing to say at all. Completely pointless. Don't even bother. But hey, at least he's... Not those men. Okay, look, I'll be honest, I think I've been a little, just a little bit harsh on you, Monte. I can't believe I'm saying this, but you might not actually be the worst sieve in this game. Your gold production bonus, though late, could be useful, and the unit's healing after combat can actually save a lot of valuable turns that would have been spent healing in place. You still suck, don't get it twisted. You're still not escaping the bottom depths of this ranking. Still rate your dance though. Now comes the man, Mr. Domination Victory himself. Shaka leading the Zulu, 
the only Civ you should be playing if you want a domination victory. Extra warrior movement and combat advantages from the get-go, enough to finish a game before it has really started. Now, I don't want to brag, but I know I'll never get to say this ever again, but I once achieved a domination victory before 1000 AD on Deity with Zulu. Okay, that's it. I just wanted to brag. And also, there was definitely no safe scumming used during that victory, by the way. Definitely not. Man, what is it with this game and butchering big boy civs? I'm sorry, but the Mongols just suck so hard. They have no redeeming qualities whatsoever. There's nothing to say about Genghis Khan's dynasty. And finally last, and maybe least, Great Brittany Britain, the land of Greggs, meat pies, and awful football referees. Who designed this civ? Who looked at this and thought this was okay? They're rubbish, as they say over there. Did an Irish guy design them? They start the game with monarchy, which helps culture, but don't you dare talk to me about culture when Caesar is in the same room. He's here, I promise. Just 15 sieves to the left. Now that I think about it, I feel like novelty will be the main factor when determining the sieve you're going to play as. You won't be left with too many options if you make your decisions based on abilities, considering that most of the sieves in the game you know suck. So if I had to rank these bunch of jokers into a tier list, it would go you, sir. Suck really, really hard. Probably the worst civ in the game, let's be completely honest. No redeeming qualities, all your abilities suck. God, oh, you suck as well, you're really, really bad. It's a shame though, isn't it? You, yeah, definitely. You go up here. Pretty much okay. C is gonna be the, I think the okay tier. Yeah, you go there as well, so do you. You as well, all of you are just okay. Nothing that good, nothing horrible like these three. Uh, okay, whatever, you go here. Uh, oh, you're not that bad actually, you're just a bit above them. Like, the best of the rest, I guess. Mao is pretty good, so is that Alexander. You are the man, you're amazing, and you're probably the best civ in the game, I'd say. You're fantastic, I love you so much. And, again, I don't know where India is. <laughs> I loaded up the tier list and India wasn't here. I don't know, they just forgot about Mr. Gandhi. But if I had to put him anywhere, anywhere he'd probably he'd probably be D or C. Probably D, I'd put him in D probably. He's so bad. Again, the only reason you should play as him is if you want to recreate the scenario of Gandhi nuking somebody. That really is it. But yeah, and also these aren't, you know, based on like actual ranking. Like I don't think Catherine is the best from these. I can't be bothered to go through these and be like, ooh, who's the best in C, who's the best in E? Not everyone's everyone is just grouped into their tiers. Don't know who's the best of each tier. Well, well, you automatically are, aren't you? That's about it, I guess. Yeah, this is the final ranking, sorta. Minus India. Okay, we're in 2026. Looks like it's plain sailing from here. Probably gonna wait. <laughs> Is Civilization Revolution pretty much? I love this game quite a bit. I don't think that's nostalgia talking. Sure, I've been playing this game since primary school, but I can comfortably say that the nostalgia adds to the experience, it doesn't define it. I mean, how many games out there let you nuke people as Gandhi? Thank you for watching. If you made it till the end, I really appreciate it. Like and comment and subscribe if you feel like it, and have an amazing rest of your day wherever you are.